are we about to enter a Capcot era of market domination? Will Dragon's Dogma 2 be the rise of a new franchise? And of course at times they have released faster than a corrupt government pins money, and even their infamous nickname, well, they have crossed the line a couple times. The stock plummeted, and they had only 152 millions left in the bank, which caused a seismic bad clench for Capcom. The result? Resident Evil 6 was a monster. Born from this mistake, a chimera of a game that I was not able to finish. They were playing the Russian roulette and there were not many ballots left. Capcom is a legend in the gaming world and they are about to drop a massive hit this week, maybe their next golden goose, Dragon's Dogma 2. They have released heavy hitters like Monster Hunter, Resident Evil, Street Fighter and Goof Troop for the hardcore fans out there. And I believe we may be entering another Capcom era, but they have a history of ups and downs and not too long ago they were going through one of their rough spots. Fans were calling them Crapcom, with good reason, while their financials look like the For Honor player charts. So today we will answer some of these questions. What's the history of Capcom and what made people hate them? Are we about to enter a Capcom era of market domination? Will Dragon's Dogma 2 be the rise of a new franchise? And most importantly, what is going on with their sequel fetish? Capcom's history is a fascinating tale of ups and downs mostly centered around these franchises. They have been quite successful overall and right from the start, they've been among the top players in the gaming industry. If we were in their character creation screen, the perks they chose would probably be Master of Innovation, with the small print saying success will lead to sequels, and the faster you release and strike from the roots, the faster you will antagonize your fan base. And of course, at times, they have released faster than a corrupt government prints money. And the second perk, you have the ability to revive any sequel of your choosing. Quite a power combination, if you ask me. But it was balanced out with the patch that introduced DLC scandals, outsourcing developments, and their abuse of the first perk, severely crippling some franchises. It's a classic case of with great power comes great responsibility, and sometimes that balance has been, well, a bit tough. I got what I wanted. It didn't make it better. But first things first, let's take a look through their history. Capcom started as quite ambitious company. They were not your typical indie born in a garage, nor the startup fueled by rich parents, now called pay to win, or the new way as Kamiki Kickstarter. Capcom was different. Its roots trace back to Kenzo Shijimoto, a Japanese entrepreneur with grand ambitions who found quite a success selling cotton candy machines. Shijimoto, in a brilliant move, sees the arcade boom as his golden ticket, launching a company in 1974 to produce these machines and later establishing IRM Corporation in 1979, which would later pivot to video games in 1983. Its name was rebranded and Capcom was born. By then, Sujimoto already had near a decade of experience in the arcade world, so Capcom began with solid financial backing and considerable ambition. Oh, wee! Rising from the ashes of the gaming crash, which hit consoles pretty hard but spared the arcade scene to some extent. It was an era dominated by titles like Mario Bros., Star Wars, and Karate Champ. So, what was Capcom's secret sauce? What was their plan to survive in such a competitive scenario? While they had a great start in idea, they got a popular genre, shoot them up, and a popular theme, World War II. 1942 was born, a great success for their second game, which of course quickly brought a sequel called 1943 and a series of other war themed games. But of course, they were not done. They could improve this, and what can improve this formula even more? Space Nazis. Brilliant idea, the iconic Bionic Commando was born. Sadly, they had to censor many references outside of Japan, where it was known as Hitler Resurrection Top Secret. Love these guys. But as many of their games of that era, it was successful due to the innovation it brought to the genre. They proved themselves to be versatile, as they tested the market venturing into various genres with significant success. They had it all from the medieval action platformer, Ghost and Goblins, to the futuristic and famous battles of Mega Man, and the competitive arenas of Street Fighter. Capcom was top tier at innovating, setting themselves as a heavyweight in the industry. Capcom's infancy was led by innovation and it set them up to a good start in the 90s. We are back in 1991, Sinfield and Prince of Federation TV Terminator 2 is about to release and the Cold War is drawing to a close. More importantly, this was where Capcom would write in a standard status in the gaming world with a groundbreaking release making intelligent use of their sequel pair. They released Street Fighter 2, a title that would not only redefine the fighting genre, but also establish Capcom as a reference in the industry. Street Fighter 2 was a brutal phenomenon, eventually selling over 6.3 million copies on the Super Nintendo alone. By 1994, it had captivated more than 25 million players worldwide 
and made an absurd amount of revenue, over 10 billion. This showcased Capcom's knack for innovation and their ability to elevate a franchise to legendary status. Not only set a new standard, it inspired countless fighting games and solidified one of their major franchises. Said in another way, they found their mojo. This game franchise was as indispensable as Minimi was for Mr. Evil. It also consolidated their motto, you are only one sequel or crossover away from success. They took this to heart, embracing their newfound mantra Capcom churn out Mega Man titles like a hen laying eggs, pushing the franchise to its limits. It's absurd amount of games they were releasing. But in hindsight seeing the annual releases of franchises like Call of Duty and FIFA, it's clear that Capcom was also one of the innovators. However, sequels weren't Capcom's only ace. They are also masters of forming strategic collaborations and producing crossover hits, making use of the broad audiences of other companies. Notably, their alliance with Disney was a major success, tapping into the vast pool of young fans through titles such as DuckTales, Aladdin, The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse, Mickey's Dangerous Chase and The Goof Troop. Once the money started rolling, there was no way this would stop there there was another collaboration that they could make, a perfect partnership for their golden goose. The Marvel vs Capcom series was born, fighting games and superheroes that seemed like the perfect arranged marriage. They also explored other tactics with much less success. There were more ways to squeeze their sequels. They chose the spin-offs. Games like Mega Man Soccer, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 and even Pocket Fighter. At this point I consider not releasing a Street Fighter brand of serials a massive blunder. This strategy of capitalizing on previous successes has been a double-edged sword. Sequels are great, often welcomed by the fans and an easy road to sell. But fans expect similar levels of quality, not a money squeeze of their dreams and goodwill. There is a fine line that crossing can lead to sales at the cost of reputation. And even their infamous nickname, well, they have crossed the line a couple times. A notable early misstep was the video game Street Fighter the movie. Inspired by the 1994 live action of Street Fighter, it was a release considered mediocre at best, and one of several Capcom's blunders. Yet it's crucial to recognize that Capcom's legacy isn't just built on the back of spin-offs and crossovers. They do release sequels that people love, and even some major hits. The popularity wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Titles like Monster Hunter and hopefully Dragon's Dogma 2 are proof of this. Back in the 90s, they were already setting the stage with games like Resident Evil and Darkstalkers. Resident Evil marked a turning point for Capcom, emerging as a flagship title for the company. It wasn't just a game, it was a revolution of the genre, paving the way for a whole new generation of horror games. Resident Evil became another landmark, laying the groundwork for a franchise ripe for expansion. As the 2000s approached, Capcom was riding high. Yet during this decade they had to sail through some rough waters. Some of their franchises took a major toll during these times. The rise of 3D gaming technology was a particular challenge for one of their main franchises, Street Fighter. This series struggled to adapt. Capcom had to take a hard decision, sending one of their major franchises to a long hiatus. It was time for other franchises to take over. The success of Resident Evil and the discovery of new franchises like Devil May Cry and Monster Hunter kept the momentum of Capcom. Particularly, they had two remarkable major releases during this decade. The release of Resident Evil 4 in 2005, receiving multiple Game of the Year awards, and the awaited comeback of Street Fighter 4 in 2008. This release of Street Fighter was massively important. The fight in general was not as popular as it used to be, and it could be the return of one of their most iconic franchises. Fortunately for them, it was a major hit that helped revitalize the genre and bring back the attention when it most needed it. After all of this, it seems like Capcom was navigating through the gaming industry with ease, yet they had an amazing idea of how to perfectly mess this up. They were about to enter the what the hell happened to Capcom, the infamous Capcom era. The company's reputation took a massive dive due to their strategies over DLCs and their attempt to capitalize on trends that, let's say, were not healthy for some of their franchises. Their early DLC strategies generated a backslash for a good reason. The release of a Street Fighter Cross Tekken in 2012 is a notable example. This game included a DLC that was already on the physical disc, locked behind a paywall. I believe that the general upset was well justified. In general, their early attempts at DLCs brought a feeling of over-monetization. It still brings that feeling, but this was abuse, which is especially detrimental to competitive games. This was not their only blunder during this time. The handling of the Resident Evil franchise also raised a few eyebrows. Driven by the success of other popular games, Resident Evil was trying to dive into the shooter genre, since they likely wanted to appeal to a larger audience than the horror needs. The result? Resident Evil 6 was a monster, born from this mistake, a chimera of a game that I was not able to finish. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure it has fans and everyone is entitled to their opinion, 
I just think theirs is not a good one. Yet this one was not the only bad release. Outsourcing the development of many titles also did not land much success. But it was not just the Resident Evil the only major saga affected. The Devil May Cry saga was also dropping the ball with the game DMC Devil May Cry being a failure from an outsourced project. The name Crapcom was appearing more and more in online forums, as their failures were involving some of the most criticized behaviors from other companies. This was getting serious, seriously bad, and of course the consequences did not take long to manifest. The stock plummeted, and they had only 152 millions left in the bank, which caused a seismic bad cleanse for Capcom. If you take into account that games like Battlefield 4 were close to 130 millions, and 152 millions was their budget for the entire massive company, they were playing on the Russian roulette and there were not many ballots left. It was safe to say that they were digging their own grave, looking for profit versus quality instead of delivering what the fans actually wanted. Despite all of this, Capcom took the critics in the chest and decided that it was time to rethink the future of their franchises. They started a pilgrimage to get their mojo back. Lucky for us, they found it. They were able to clutch it out of the situation and they are bringing back one franchise after the other. The release of Resident Evil 7 in 2017 saw again to the world the ability of Capcom to revitalize their franchises. They listened to the fanbase, returned to the roots of the horror theme, and it was a major success. They've also struck gold with titles like The Will May Cry 5 and especially, as you know, Monster Hunter World, which still remains a powerhouse and one of the top games on Steam. It seems like the key all along was focusing on what the players want, and bringing back the development of some of these games from outsourced studios contributed to achieve this. I do have to point out that some of their DLC practices are still questioned by the fans, but the reputation of the company has seriously improved. So with all of this in mind, it's time we answer the questions of the beginning as objectively as possible. Feel free to give your take about this in the comments. In general, it feels like Capcom follows the right direction, and as long as the grid doesn't surpass the quality, I expect it to stay that way. Regarding Dragon's Dogma 2, it's obvious that they love their sequels, but they do a much better job when time passes between releases and as they focus on what made their games shine. I believe that they are in a very interesting point. Dragon's Dogma 2 has a lot of attention on it, and if this game is as good as it seems, it can be the start of a new franchise, and hopefully, become one of the major titles in the RPG landscape, although it's too soon to say. But the opportunity is there. Regardless, everything points out that they are quite serious with the game. After all, developing open world games are a huge investment, and something they struggled with the first game. It kind of reminds me of the time gap to Street Fighter 4. But releasing RPGs and succeeding is massively difficult. I like to believe that if this does as well as it seems it will, we will be already in the Capcot era. Let me know what you think in the comments, and if the video entertained you, a like is much appreciated. Thank you for watching.